to another edition of Here We Are. I'm your host, Tanita Cheatham. You know, thank you for tuning in. You know, about a year ago, we started doing segments regarding the negative stereotypes of African Americans that are perpetuated by groups outside and within our culture. Because of the great response we get whenever we do this topic, we revisit the issue from time to time and discuss it from different angles. I want to take this opportunity to thank those who called in with their wonderful responses, both positive and critical. Now in this segment, we revisit the issue, and our focus this time is, what are today's prevailing projections of African Americans as portrayed by the media? Now joining me in this discussion is our resident media analyst, Brenda Verner. Brenda Verner is also an educator and communications consultant, among other things. We also have veteran journalist Vernon Jarrett, who has worked in print and electronic media for over half a century. I want to thank you both for coming to the program. It's so nice to have you here. Thank you. Did I mess up? I mean, teacher, I mean, you do a lot as it relates to it, but the thing that we'd love to have you come on mm -hmm. for is to talk to us about your, um, and I hope I'm saying this right, 20 years experience in analyzing the media, particularly as it relates to African yeah, it's been longer than 20 years, but I'll, I'll take but I'm, 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 okay, so I, okay. So I see, I'd rather come under than go <laughs> right, over. Right, right. Let's, let's take it there. <laughs> and then Vernon, I mean, ooh, you, television, radio, print, and you still working. They just won't let you retire with it. I don't mind not retiring. <laughs> I don't mind. It's the devil's workshop. I understand. Right. <clears throat> What I did was I broke out the questions under different topics, and we can certainly jump over the map. But um, you know, when it comes to reporting stories, uh, crime stories, do you think that the gap has narrowed between crimes committed against African Americans and the way they're reported as opposed to crimes committed by whites? I hadn't thought about it <laughs> in, the, in, in that fashion. Because the idea is there's so many crimes, and there's another entree to the equation called DNA. But that's a relatively new phenomenon. Twisted the whole thing around, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But it has saved so you said a lot of the, lives the and has let free, go free, many, many people. Well, I think there's a difference between how they're treated in the media as opposed how to the stories are reported. them possibly being exonerated for a crime. For example, um, uh, we seem to have how many years? How many years has it been since the O.J. trial? Uh, it was in 1995, 96. Okay. 95 and 96. Since then, we've had sensational issues w uh, around African Americans with regard to behavior. Mm -hmm. The latest is Kobe Bryant. Mm -hmm. I believe that if that the girl who accused him of rape were white, we wouldn't have this kind of sensationalism. Uh, Black you mean women. If, if the girl who accused her I mean, was we're black. black, we're black. Uh -huh. she, we wouldn't have this kind of sensationalism. So there is a difference in the way. Uh, it consistently is there. It's aware. I mean, well, Mike Tyson's accuser was black. Uh, and it wasn't. It wasn't. This, it wasn't the same kind of sensationalism about uh, about it. Mike Tyson is a bad boy, you know. Um, well, I don't. I, I would. Well, I he would. certainly presented himself when he was in the courtroom <laughs> as a bad person. I would. I would say. You know, I would call him a bad boy, and he has a long history of this. I think his routine kind of like reporting on him, especially after he went to jail. It's like Mike Tyson is in the news all the time for doing something. What is his latest event? He was in a hotel lobby. And, and I think I saw something on television. But see, those footage. people harassing him. Well, not that it made it, it doesn't right. doesn't matter, but they he just has him. this long standing. It's like an interesting kind of saga. Mike, Mike Tyson, he's going to fight. Well, he puts a what? on his face and he a tattoo he's attacking people it's it's he's got his own kind of personal thing going as opposed to but his image wasn't all that bad and before before that young lady accused him i think, I think it was what, well see and i, and I kind of tend to agree with running on this just to watch the blood flow out and they have to ship you off you got a bad image I mean, in relationship to him being, uh, I hate to say use the word predator, but, you know, uh, a womanizer or to be abusive to what women, you really didn't hear about that side of him. That only came out when he was in court. And he perpetuated a lot of that. I mean, he talked a lot about, you know, his, his uh, libido and all that. You know, so, I mean, that came out in court. Really? Yeah, I mean, it well, was... Long before what, he went to court, I knew about Mike Tyson because okay, I make well, it my business I, to know what the, who these people are. You are a media analyst. And uh, I was always, I used to warn people 
about supporting him out of hand. Because I believe if you can slit your brother's wrists, you can do anything to anybody. Do you hear what I'm saying? But then let's say, but this, is, you know, this is a strange thing. This is the first time I've heard of that. Yeah. yeah, I never heard of that either. That's right. why I'm saying his and profile. I mean, you would know, know him as being a good fighter, and, 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 well, yeah, but I never, I never viewed Mike Tyson as a uh, a person that was abusive toward women until he went uh, until this case. Really? Yeah, until this case, I didn't know about it. But I kind of wanted to back up for a moment. You, you uh, seem like you were at, at varying sides of the issue as it relates to crimes reported uh, against uh, African Americans, and we're talking about athletes now. In this instance, with Kobe Bryant, you have this uh, clean-cut, uh, uh, good guy, middle class, you know, middle class <laughs> good guy, you know, um, good upbringing, you know, and then you have a difference uh, with regard to uh, Tyson. But you seem to think that there's a bit of a difference. Uh, there was not much of a difference in the way that the issues were reported. Well, it was sensationalized. That's the yeah, main thing. Yeah, that's fact. all. The fact is, everybody heard about it. They're going to have grist. See, I think you, the, when you have 24-7 news um, coverage, you need grist. And anybody is subject to it, but I think certain people are going to get, provide more grist than others, uh, if you know what I mean. And I, uh, Kobe Bryant, my son, uh, I have a, a son who is uh, ESPN addicted. And um, it, it, it's just astounding to me how addicted he is to this uh, phenomenon. ESPN is a phenomenon to me, anytime you need two channels. So uh, this Kobe Bryant, when this thing occurred, uh, we've talked about Kobe Bryant over and over again, uh, about him being a superstar about young black men being encouraged to uh, relinquish obligation and a commitment to African-American culture uh, to find themselves out, you know, mm -hmm. adrift from their parents and in a world where they are just turned in inside out. Here's a question. He may be a nice guy, but how do you be in a room with somebody for 20 minutes you don't know and have sex with him? I have an issue with the whole thing. Well, it's obvious they had met before and they'd had conversations before. Mm -mm. Well, we don't know that. The court, well, see, here we are jumping to conclusions. And, and again, there for and again you perpetuate I mean, for a, certain, uh, a certain image. But it goes back to the point, the question I'm asking is are there differences in the way uh, that crime, uh, crimes committed by African Americans are reported in the media as opposed to their white counterparts? Now, we're talking about celebrity athletes. Um, Okay, fine, let's keep it on that. I was going to be, go a bit broader, but let's keep it on that. I say that there may be some differences. There's always been a difference. In the way they report the, the story. Was, it's much better than it was when I was a boy. The but newspapers used to take the lead in whetting up the appetites for lynch mobs. Yes. Big, burly Negro. White girl. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, see, that issue is still here. It's just not spoken about in the same manner. A white girl accuses, accuses a black male of rape. Mm -hmm. it, the whole country goes berserk. Mm -hmm. A white woman kills her children and says a black man stole them. The whole town, the whole state starts turning in the black community inside out. Did a it white, change when they found out it was her, though? No, I think she, they never apologized. That guy killed his wife in Boston. They turned Roxbury into a, a, a detention camp. Uh, and they never, they, there's an understood uh, reaction to black male crossing the line into white life. And that sensationalism and outrage is that reaction. It's still here. The stereotypes, the reaction, the trained reactions are still here. They're just presented in a codified manner. What I'd like to see white America do is just simply understand that this business of pe creating images of black people has a long, long history, and at one time it was a necessity if the white-dominated society was to survive. You, you have to create images of a black person as something less than human if you are going to be a slave master. Let's face it that way. If you're going to cut out the tongue of somebody for on his third, three strikes you out, you know, mm -hmm. slavery thing, you have to justify that. You can't do that and sit in church and call yourself civilized. Uh, you can't even write a constitution like we did 
where the reference was that blacks are three-fifths human. You just can't do that in, unless you can justify it, not only to yourself, but you've got to convince a lot of white people. That's As a matter of fact, white America has had the, the, the task of trying to convince the majority of white people that slavery was right, and they concentrated on it to the extent that white people who don't own slaves are going off to war to, to, to maintain a system that was keeping them poor. See, all but white it was people, a system that let that me finish. Made, all white people did not profit from slavery. But of course they did. Because the, there was no, you're saying they all didn't, you're saying that they did. You, I'm saying that they no, did they, to they, the degree well, that we have a system that said to every white man that came to this country, there is a bottom beneath which you will not drop. Well maybe and, I'm not making myself okay. understood here. Only about less than twenty four percent of the white population in the South owned slaves. Now that's a whole lot of other people to convince. Now the people in my mother's family, those are the ones that I happen to remember the best, who were slaves. They were taking jobs away from white people in the same uh, vocation. Uh, my mother's family, most of the men in it were carpenters, builders, uh, cabinet workers, and blacksmiths. Every job they took for free denied some white guy in the same a business an, an income. So this man's not going to be happy about that. You've got to convince him that slavery was ordained by God. And so they had researchers going through the Bible, finding everything they could to justify slavery. This is why my grandmother didn't care too much about St. Paul in some parts of Matthew. But I Service think that there's another side masters. to it. But there's another side to it, and it's the entire system. It's the social fabric of America that says uh, th uh, if you're white, even if you're poor, you will always have a leg up over a black man. Well, that's where the propaganda came in, to convince these poor white people that you are, the only thing they could hang their hats on was that God made you superior like he made me a slave owner, a slave owner. You see, the people in the North and the people in the South who fought each other uh, were not debating, not too loudly, the inferiority of black people. They assumed that that was a fact. They all had been taught that. So what they were fighting over, which system is going to be the best for this particular category? And, and we were entering slowly into an, in, an industrialized world. Mm -hmm. You see, this wasn't just uh, some white people having different opinions about black people. Both sides looked at black people as inferiors. But see, you know, what you're talking about lays the foundation, and to bring it back to what we're talking about, as we talk about the images that are perpetuated and why, I mean, this kind of speaks to where it started mm -hmm. and, you know, and how it's... it's, it's Every it's institution in America, in, in Western civilization, was called upon to justify slavery. Every single one was a propaganda machine. Harvard imported one of its finest, if you want to quote, end quote, anthropologist from Germany, Louis Agassiz, to come here and preach the inferiority of the black people. And they had measurements of skulls and shapes of faces and everything to justify what? Well, I think, I think it was also, what, there's another perspective to all of this, that if you're going to bring people in, you're going to enslave them. You have to not only dehumanize them, but you also have to make your, your, your system uh, a system of law that gives you the authority to do it. Mm -hmm. The Constitution, the, the thing that ups upsets me today about America today is that the Constitution is still in that rotunda. There has been no invisible ink to blot out the fact that this Constitution says that we were three-fifths human beings. Every eighth grader that goes to New York, I mean to Washington, D.C. on their eighth grade trip, every foreigner that comes in here and visits and reads that Constitution, today takes the legacy of the three-fifths human being away with him, despite the, you know, uh, um, the constitutional amendments. And I believe that is why we can legitimately, not we, but there is a legitimate or legitimatized conversation today about affirmative action with regard to African Americans being educated when it was codified in our past that we were not supposed to be educated, you see? 
uh, it, it has a legacy. The legacy is today that why should, why should they be equal? Because in our past, the law said that they weren't supposed to be educated. I believe that's the only reason we could have this conversation about affirmative action. Because when it comes to white women, affirmative action has been perfectly okay with even conservatives. When white women reach parity, the discussion goes to uh, affirmative action is racist. Reverse racism. Let's tie this back into what we're talking about today. Because mm -hmm. I think this gives a lot of foundation to kind of, of why we see what we see. And I see it as being worse, I, even in light of uh, the fact that the FCC have changed rules and now you have all these uh, companies, you have these big corporations buying up all these different media companies. And I'm thinking that maybe the images of African Americans, the projection that we see will probably grow worse. I could be wrong. I thought that on I the I think table. you may be right. Anytime you have the WB and UPN, I call them the Coon ne Networks, uh, turning out this Coon Fair. Uh, and, and right in uh, the same time that we're supposed to be so enlightened, so sophisticated, but daily there's coon shows. You can turn on UPN and WB and be assured that you'll run across a coon show. But see, the argument could be that, okay, you're seeing more African Americans at different levels within these different networks. Doesn't it still, doesn't it still play to the message that they were coons in the past and they're coons now? Mm, I don't <laughs> as long as you can pay someone to carry out, it's, it's the same thing. You paid them to dress up in blackface, to slander, culturally slander themselves. You can pay them today. Hmm. I don't know if I, I see your point, I hear where you're coming from, but I'm not necessarily 100% of that. The I'm same familiar. networks put out the, the, the Gilmore Girls, you know, uh, dramas about white life and young white people. Is there a drama about black life and young black people? On the same networks. It's all, they're all, when I call them coon fair, they're these comedy shows that are supposed to reflect black life, but they're exaggerated stereotypes, and I could take them off the trade cards or the postcards that I have, or the ads, and, and just put them on <laughs> television. And they're just a modern day version of the same thing. Well, that's because the public lets this happen. That's true. There are people who can rationalize all of this, and you've got some black people making enormous sums of money doing it. Because, like I said, the argument could be made that there are more African Americans. At least in when I was a kid, going to the movies, seeing the Uncle Toms, the Step and Fetchets, and, and uh, Willie Bess, and the Angie Mimers, I, I never heard them degrade black women the way I hear it today. And I have never seen, even in the old time minstrel shows, mm -hmm black women on the air the using some of the vulgarities. Being debased. Yeah. Hold that thought, because I want you to finish that when we come back after this, because we'll pick that up right after this. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. And have laid their bodies down. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, That's how we perpetuate it. Welcome We're back. Perfect. I'm Tanita Cheatham, and this is Here We Are. And we're having a very interesting conversation today. We're talking about the projections of African-American stereotypes uh, as it relates to the media. And one of the things that we had talked about uh, was how other cultures have has, has done that to us. But before we left, Vernon, you were bringing up a very good point about how we as a culture perpetuate those stereotypes in, our, in the media. It and happens I all the time. I, they, some of our black entertainers have legitimized the word nigger, where anybody can just say it any time. Bitch, whole, minute, uh, intimate descriptions of sexual acts between blacks. And it's not just only funny, it's hilarious. You watch some of these TV shows late at night, and some not so late. The audience seems to be made up of young, college-age, intelligent people, and they're just cracking up at self-degradation. I couldn't even describe some of the jokes I've heard them tell. Yeah, BET is the biggest perp uh, perpetrator of cultural slander 
that I have ever seen in the history of black America. Uh, daily, we see these shows with these comedians, and the comedians are the purveyors of this, this cultural uh, genocide against us. It's um, toxic, the popular culture, there are two types of culture in black America. One is traditional, and the other is popular culture that's driven by the dominant culture. And uh, as a matter of fact, in, in popular culture America, there's black popular culture that influences white popular culture, but the rules for white popular culture do not drive black popular culture. You, you don't see um, 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 these uh, white comedians degrading their women, their mothers, their church, their God, the way ours routinely do. So you're saying there are differences. Because I, I think about uh, programming uh, that I see in, uh, in particular on HBO or Showtime uh, where you have, European uh, or you have white people in it and I mean it, I mean it's just it's ugly it's ridiculous I don't know if I should mention any on TV uh, <laughs> but uh, you know I, I, yes I've seen but they're 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 so how, is that how far they can go but, but, and but when they cross is, the line the you will hear no when you when they I mean, cross the line you'll hear about it. okay so when they cross the line well, you'll hear about it certain people there'll yeah be there'll be a backlash there's Whereas no we backlash. Don't have as much backlash oh no we don't have there's nothing sacred there is nothing sacred anymore uh, She's I've, correct on that score. Mm, okay. This I was is why I took a position on, on that movie, Barbershop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see, there ought to be some individuals. Someone should have slapped him on the hand and said. No, no, let me finish. Okay. There's some, there are some individual achievers in black history that you just don't make nasty remarks about. Mm -hmm. You don't use vulgarity mm -hmm. in describing them, even in a joke, like the star one of the stars of Barbershop did, referring to Mrs. Park, she set her, mm -hmm. you know what, we down, <laughs> and that's all she did. And referring to Martin Luther King's holiday should be turned into All Freaks Day. Uh, I don't hear Jewish people make remarks about Golda Meir, uh, a, a kind Wiseman. Or Irish people, or well, no, they, any other people, Italians or anyone so. else. So this is how we prepare. There are some individuals that are out of out of bounds when it comes to being able to get talk nasty and make vulgar jokes about. But we have a history in America, and this is a dominant culture history, of using comedy to slander black people and b make black people laugh at the slander themselves. And I think the slander has been inculcated. Um, these these comedians are being used to degrade the culture, they get incredible amounts of money for it. Uh, young black people are enthralled by the money, but our dignity is sacrificed. And the question is, do we know what dignity is anymore? And there are some older black people who go along with this, too. Right. Uh, do we have any idea of what cultural uh, integrity is? Should we turn it over to the least among us, these comedians, many of whom have not even graduated high school? to represent the best of us. And the question is, are we going to police ourselves? How can we when the studios are not, I mean, they're not owned by us? I mean, the, the, well, the vehicles in which we project or present our images are not owned by us. I think uh, the, the thing that's missing from our experience in this nation, and, and uh, if I look per perplexed, the question is, why is it? When I go to Washington, D.C., when I travel around this country, I know, I have come to find out that there is a Hispanic National Congress, there is an Asian National Congress, there uh, is a Jewish, I mean, there's more than one Jewish Congress, but we have no self, intracultural, self-governing body. None. The NAACP is not our governing body. We need a self-governing, intracultural body that would deal with our issues. We are, we, are being, we are being slung around like a dog by the tail. Anybody that has the political clout can push us back and forth, and we have no standing structure except that uh, these, these organizations that exist only deal with um, uh, pathology as opposed to proactive, pro progressive movement. We don't hear from other minority groups in this country uh, they're not constantly on television contest, I mean, uh, conducting their cultural business on TV. Do you notice that there's a whole genre 
of uh, black people who are on cable television who keep the idea that we're supposed to be discussing black people as a problem in America every day. Not we should sure. not be presented as a problem. That we are not. We are part of the the heart and fabric of this country. Certainly not this show. Yes. <laughs> and and, and uh, the exception. Vernon, you were about to comment. Uh, I'm. I don't know where to start. We're covering a, a lot of general territory. We're a lot of territory. And uh, territory. specifically, I think we've just got to get our kids to make some of their own decisions by getting them to read more. This is what I've tried mm -hmm. to do on the outside with my life. I have a group of youngsters who meet, and we're called the Freedom Readers. We read from the great uh, pages of black literature and black history, like the speeches. I've edited down several of the speeches to where it's easy to do, and they do it as though they are anchor people on TV. They get a lot of fun out of this. Mm -hmm. Like some of the great speeches from Frederick Douglass, you not only earn a respect for the man as you would for Du Bois. We just had the 100th anniversary of the Souls of Black Folk, mm -hmm. and there weren't too many people talking so about that book. Radar screen, yeah. mm -hmm. It's hardly, hardly any recognition where you can learn how to talk. One thing, if you read some of the great literature from black history, some of the great speeches, some of the great debates, like I hear people talking about Liberia as though we black people decided ourselves to create us a country when it was really, cr really created by the American Colonization Society, which was not the true name of the organization. That's a sort of bromide. The true name of the American Colonization Society was the Society for the Colonization of Free Blacks of co uh, Free Men of Color. In other words, the, Liberia was created to siphon off as many free black people as they possibly could mm -hmm. and put them over there because they considered free blacks as a nuisance in the United States. And uh, many people are astounded to know that we had a meeting in 1817. This was before Frederick Douglass. As a matter of fact, the year he was born, we had a big meeting at Mother Bethel AME Church in Philadelphia where you had close to 2,000 free blacks that came from all parts of the North. And they had a meeting and denounced the idea of colonizing us in another country, uh, which Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson was the originator, one of the original propagandists in terms of colonizing us after freeing us. And then Lincoln picked it up. You know, Lincoln had a meeting with uh, Frederick Douglass and I think about six other black, other black leaders trying to convince them that they should come out and take the lead mm -hmm. in us leaving this country after we're free. Yeah, he wanted us to go back. And I think you should know that that first meeting in 1817 and 18, had another one the next year in 1818, they denounced the idea of, of them after having fought in all the great battles for this country, leaving their black brothers enslaved behind and going to Africa. These are things that you teach these kids that you're mentoring. Oh, yeah, well, this is some of the st stuff that we're into. And but we're doing what we're doing is just simply reading from the great speeches mm -hmm. and the great essays. And you get an education and also learning how to talk. If you realize that Frederick Douglass was self-taught, and when he escaped, what did he escape with? Two books, his most valuable pieces of equipment. And when he escaped from slavery at the age of 21, he had two books. One was a simple speller, Webster Speller, and another one was uh, the only recorded book at that time of the great speeches in history. Uh, the Colombian orations. And this is why this man taught himself to read and to express himself fluently, and he passed it on. And this is why we, the book's dedicated, I mean, our movement's dedicated to him. Every, from now on, every September, we're going to celebrate his, the anniversary of his escape. Mm -hmm. So as we're talking about how do we approach the situation, how do we start to change it? We start dealing with our children. And so, uh, children, and some of them at some point are going to say, look, this sick stuff that we're doing on TV, uh, others are doing, we're not going to accept this. You think it'll top out? Huh? You think it'll top out? What do you mean, cop What out? I mean by that, you know, top. top out. Do you think you'll get to the point where, okay, we're tired of this, we want something different? Well, I think just native intelligence. See, we're not the only intelligent people in the world sitting here. We, whatever conclusions we've reached about the degradation of black people, it came from somewhere. Yes, and it's a common thought among us. The question is, how do we develop uh, ve vehicles 
to overcome it, we need to raise the intellect of our young people. And we, we must hold up the light of our past intellect. You see, they believe uh, if, if there's none right now, then there shouldn't have been any in the past. That's why these jokes are so acceptable. These comedians uh, uh, play to the basis part of the young people, and he's talking about play, playing to the part that is in every young person, an ideal, you know? <laughs> You know, this begs me to ask a question. You know, Vernon, you have been a uh, television commentator, radio, print, over, uh, over half a century. You have seen African-American -American journalists come in, leave out, retire, that kind of thing. Have you noticed the changes? We're talking about, you know, at one time educated to now where we are, where we are now and trying to get back to there. Have you seen that fluctuation? Yeah. I can see it in, in my own time. When I came to Chicago to become a journalist, that was my idea. I had made up my mind that I was going to leave that little town in Tennessee and come to Chicago where I, I would have the best chance of becoming a writer. And I applied for, at the Chicago Defender, and uh, I applied at two other black papers when the, 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 the Defender was slow. All the way from the latter part of March into June, to finally the, the Defender hired me. Uh, I came here not with the one iota of a thought of ever working on a white publication. Mm -hmm. That was out. Uh, I came to Chicago as a young man to make history, as a sort of a crusader, and uh, to and become you what you would call an activist journalist. And all of the black newspapers at that time, for the most part, were activist journalists. You made your reputation by being spokesman for your people, our mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. you see. But uh, now when the market opens up, uh, there are some, and I, I don't want to leave any impression that I'm accusing other black people younger than I, who for having sold out, they have not. Some of them are just as strong as I am on many issues. But you are there to get a job and to come across as to what is expected of you in the mainstream media, if you want to call it that. And uh, you certainly are not going to be out there sounding like I did when I first came in. My thing was strictly protest. As a matter of fact, on the outside, I was protesting. Uh, I was one of the young organizers of the Progressive Party. Mm. We chose the left-wing Henry Wallace who had been vice president under Roosevelt to run for president. I was one of them, a megaphone, loudspeaker in the streets. And we used to fight the machine while serving as journalists. As a matter of fact, I was fired from one or two newspapers because for, for going a little to the extreme in their judgment, and maybe they were correct, because they still have to sell advertising. See, black people always have had this contradiction. You want to stand up, I mean black publications. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you're going to have to depend for major advertisements from the white people. And so they got a contradiction. The best thing you can do is to make sure that those white folk who want to sell their merchandise to black people will come to you because you have the biggest readership. And at the same time, you're going to maintain your readership. You're going to have to take a stand. And this is something I think I have done for years without ever But one of the problems, in. as I see it, with that, with the journalism, with regard to African American, being uh, in the uh, mainstream. No, just, just the owners, the owners of African American media within interculturally, okay. um, have not played to the intellect of the African American community, mm. and. Um, um, that is something that, when I look at older publications like Crisis, I have a huge collection of old publications. When I look at them, and I mean as far back as I can go, I think the oldest thing I have is like 1780-something. Um, the If you go from that point to our point now, it's like going from erudite to damn near stupid. It's like I mean, even when we were, uh, didn't have access to schools, our standards were higher than when we have access to schools. Uh, what has happened is a coarsening of American society in general. Popular culture has degraded. When you turn on your television, you're subject to see anything. 
I mean, anything. I watch television with the remote in my hand. So we're talking about the coarsening of the entire society. But when the entire society is coarsened inside a black culture, it is, I mean, it's like a free-for-all. We used to choose our comedians. We were in charge of the people who were popular. I remember when I was a kid, my mother, remember how Dinah Washington and Sarah Vaughn and all of them used to dress beautifully? They not only dressed beautifully, but were incredibly talented people. Nowadays, all you have to do is show your, your boobs or your behind. You don't have to have any talent. These people were dignified when I was growing up as a kid. Well, we, we've always had the problem, though, of not exactly choosing your, your comedy. Right. The comedy has, white you're right, it, still, it covers. White it people co own the big medical shows that tour the South. Right. Again, people in charge of Sweet the Papa Snowball. I'm going all the way back. Mm -hmm. Silas Green from New Orleans. These were tent shows like the circuses that used to come. Rabbit's Foots. <laughs> And they would have a parade in the little town I grew up in when the minister shows would come in town. I remember my brother got a whipping for every, the black kids wanted to carry a banner in the parades around the town square when the minister shows came. Of course, the circuses did the same thing. They'd have the tigers and the elephants. Mm -hmm. uh, but some of the jokes were horrible. I mean, they, they weren't as vulgar because the white people were not going to tolerate too much and sexual And the black people in the, t in the community at that point would, would not tolerate. They so tolerated like, some so awful there was stuff. Outrage, Wait, and let then me there tell was you. Right. energy put toward dampening they that. They did tolerate some pretty strong, mm -hmm. some one of the worst jokes I ever heard was about Paul going to New York and up on the skyscraper. We're not going to tell the whole joke on it. No, Please, it's a we quick, don't want to hear it. It's, <laughs> it's a quicker joke. <laughs> to show you the type of in, insinuating degradation that people engaged in. He got up and fell, lost his balance and fell 75 flights down. And they would tell, grab a window, grab something, Paul, grab it. Then his little son on the first floor said, Paul, you about to hit a white woman. And he turned around and went all the way back up in the air. This is, these are the type of the jokes. <laughs> so, the yeah, and the, idea, and the white people in the audience applauded and the black folks laughed. And even on those, in those minstrel shows, the whites had reserved segregated seats in the front. Oh, yeah. I mean, after a while, white people also dressed up in blackface themselves and did the After a show. while, they, they were mm -hmm. the propagators in the right. first place. The well, originally, the shows show... was the biggest shows before the turn of the century, mm -hmm. better than mm -hmm. Broadway or anything. The, right. The blackface show. I think they went show. to Vaudeville uh, from Minstrelsy. Uh, but it's, it's an interesting history, legacy that's still alive. That's what astounds me. But when let me I tell you, we TV. survived a lot of that because we continued to protest. But, we but we're not protesting as much. No. We, they got slick ways of doing it. If you can come up with a barbershop, a movie like a barbershop, and make it acceptable to a big chunk of the... I've had young serious arguments with young and old mm -hmm. about the columns I wrote attacking barbershop. I think about the movie Bamboozled. I thought that was a good movie. What I think is I that comedians should know that there are certain things that you're not supposed to do. A certain line you're and, not supposed to cross. And uh, people uh, should, uh, the, the first line of defense should be the press. The press should, um, people should have their opinions, op-eds, to tell, I've heard and seen things in these so-called uh, black produced movies that appall me. They're not a form of entertainment. They only carry forth the agenda uh, that uh, these people want us to carry forth. Uh, and it's astounding to me that the love of money me, it knows no bounds now. You, your dignity doesn't count. Your, your uh, uh, decency doesn't count anymore. Uh, our children are being uh, slathered with pornography. And uh, daily, these people come on so-called black entertainment network to do it to us. And using women. Right, the women. <laughs> uh, when, when, you debase, when you debase the women of any family, culture, or community, you are debasing everybody in it because everybody in the family, culture, or community came through a woman. That's why white Westerners attempted to exalt the image of woman, because in the same process, the male exalts himself. When you degrade your women, debase them, any group of men who deba degrade, debase, and 
abandon their own women and children are targeting themselves you're speaking for of, you, You're speaking of in, in a crude form because white right. society did denigrate women. Of course women they did. Women couldn't vote until 1920. Right. That was, a, that was a form of control, <clears throat> but at the same time, they would put them on the pinnacle of a building. Yeah, yeah. All of their mm -hmm. statues would show them. They would... The name of Columbia, Absolutely. the gem of the earth, ocean, the, the symbols for every Western country is a woman. But remember this. Mm -hmm. It was phony because the f 15th Amendment gave black people the right to vote mm -hmm. black men. Mm -hmm. That's the earliest, 1870. But you had another amendment you had to pass for white women to be universally declared eligible to vote. And they didn't vote until 1920. You right. can see a big chunk of years. And there. Katie Stanton and uh, <coughs> those women who were in the suffrage movement uh, began to call black men monkeys. These same women who are supposed to have this lofty history of uh, suffrage, they were so upset that the white men, black men would get the vote before white women that they started this campaign to show that black men were not human enough to have the vote before them. But yeah. don't forget something. Mm -hmm. White men were the ones who voted for their own ulterior motives right. was to give black males the right to vote. Mm -hmm. There's always a, an underlying motive behind almost everything that happens. And I think the, the point in all of the, everything that you've said about our history, Vernon, is that we had to fight for every inch of progress that we've made. Mm -hmm. and, if, and what has and happened... taking it back. What, no, what they're taking back is our young people's intellect and their consciousness to continue to fight. They have corralled them into a toxic popular culture that is self-denigrating, degrading and debasing. They no longer have to do it to us. We'll, we make, it to we'll make videos ourselves. We're gonna talk about that and how can we reverse this, this trend, if it's reversible, when we come back. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Chicago hospitals have a dirty little secret called discriminatory pricing. They charge the uninsured working poor more for health care. It's absurd. Imagine a black woman going into a hospital emergency room screaming, I want to be overcharged. Supersize my bill. I want maximum strength billing. Who's a girl got to sleep with to get price gouged around here? Sounds crazy. The reality is that people don't choose to be price gouged. The leading price gouger in Chicago is Advocate Healthcare, according to a study by SEIU. Apparently, there is huge profit potential off the uninsured who don't know their prices are jacked up like a used car lot. 80,000 Chicagoans were potential victims of discriminatory pricing. Blacks and Latinos are the most affected by this practice. We must hold our hospitals accountable to the community, consumers, and caregivers. We can't depend on Bush to find a solution to health care. He can't find anything these days. Unemployment is high, and he can't find jobs. Al-Qaeda is still a threat, and he can't find bin Laden. He can't find weapons of mass destruction or Saddam Hussein. The only thing Bush has found is Social Security Trust Fund that he's using for things other than old folks' security. Anyway, I'm digressing. African health care system is the leading price gouger of blacks and Latinos in Chicago. We must hold them accountable fair prices for the uninsured in Chicago hospitals because the dirty little secret is out. Welcome back. That was Tori Muhammad. and thank you for your commentary. Uh, as we are entering the last few minutes of our conversation, we've been talking about uh, stereotypes of African Americans in uh, media. We have received a history lesson. <laughs> uh, I'm speaking to uh, Vernon uh, Jarrett, uh, journalist, and uh, Brenda Verna, media analyst. And before we left, we were talking about how uh, we, as a culture, have perpetuated the negative stereotypes that are out there. But let's reel it back. Um, during the break, we were talking about how uh, it's important to teach and educate our culture, our children, their children, about who we are, our wonderful history and who we are and the important impact that we have made 
on our culture. And I think that's where we start, is, is where we can start in turning around. Well, I think it's about. even more than that. We need to develop a curriculum. We have no excuse today, really. We have enough we have a lot uh, of college, college educated uh, educators, African Americans, more than in, ever in our history. We yet, yet we have not focused on this issue of uh, uh, putting up a barrier uh, with intellect and education. And uh, it's something that we're going to, in various avenues, are going to have to build and maintain. Uh, I, that's what I do for a living. And I, uh, I know that I am not alone. I, I train parents. I do a lot of work with uh, young people. Uh, the three of us uh, only reflect a, a majority opinion among African Americans. And I think we need to use uh, the churches as teaching vehicles. We need to use these schools. But our educators and interested persons should come together to form, you know, constructure approaches to changing the atmosphere and the intellectual perspective of young people. Well, I think we're going to have to do several basic things that are not extreme. Because if you start adding up all of the deficits against us, you say, it's all over. You can't win. How are you going to beat the system as powerful as it is and as weak as I am as an individual? So the best thing you can do is assume that there are a lot of intelligent people out here if you give them the ingredients to make intelligent decisions. And then just let it go from that because you can, go, you can crack up when you start weighing what is against you and and what you have going for you at a particular moment. But if you just look back in history and see what your ancestors had to overcome, coming out of a basic, say, 90% ignorance, couldn't read and write, even as late as the turn of the century. And this is what I do all the time. I just start thinking of some of the people I've interviewed over the past, say, 50 years when I first was, came out of puberty to be a journalist here in the city and wondered how they survived. I look at my own brother. I look at my own family. He, he's dead now, but he's a great source of inspiration. He was my high school teacher. And I can remember as a little boy when he was attending what they called a high school. It wasn't even really a high school. And I have to ask myself, how did he end up even wanting to get a college degree a master's degree, not to mention a PhD degree from the University of Chicago in history. And look at Percy Julian, the same thing. Here's a man who gave us cortisone, PhD from the University of Vienna, coming out of another situation in Montgomery, Alabama, where they didn't have a sound high school for black folk. And the main thing, somebody saw to it that they didn't get their spirits killed. Mm -hmm. You see, you can't kill the spirit. Uh, my brother was on the faculty at Oxford in 1954. This was before the, months before the Supreme Court rendered his Brown versus Board of Education. He was on the faculty as a visiting professor of English at Oxford. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? When most of the white people in our county that he came from didn't have it. But he was inspired to achieve and want to achieve. And the assumption is you got some intelligence. He was no genius. Well, I'm not supposed to be a journalist in Chicago. What was there in Paris, Tennessee to make me think I could be a writer? Well, the people did it. The people did a lot of little grassroots stuff. And I've, I've tried to duplicate this in AXO with NACP. Maybe you heard a little something of it. Uh, we've got kids out here being entertained and entertaining us by their achievements. The black community started my journalism career by simply applauding me for a little two before essay that I wrote, which was 90% fiction, when I was in the seventh grade. And I got the idea that I was a writer from them, not from the, out the outside society said I was a little inferior Negro. And so I just made myself a writer. And of course, the academicians in the town, the teachers and the one or two uh, music teachers, along with the people in the school system and the doctors and dentists, 
they encouraged us to. These were the achievement people, the icons. I think everybody who is an icon, whether by choice or public definition, should be out here doing something to stimulate respect for yourself. Now, this is the one thing I had. My grades were not that good in elementary and high school, I got to tell you. But I did have a lot of respect for whatever little tinge of talent that I thought God had given me. And the people were the ones who told me about it. So we just have to put the spirit back. We have to put that energy back into our families, into our communities uh, as it relates to this, educating ourselves about how we need to project positiveness. I think we have to also recognize that I think we're in a period, you know, we haven't been too long out of uh, total isolation, that we're in a period where we have to learn how to rebuild our institutions and to use those institutions mm -hmm. to our best uh, interest. Uh, and I think that we have to set a higher standard, consistently reaching for a higher standard. Um, I agree with you on the higher standard because we've accepted standards that we wouldn't have accepted a few years ago. That's got us in this ago. position in the first place. Right. Especially yeah. on this business of entertaining where women are continuously pro portrayed mm -hmm. in every kind of vulgar position you can think of. But I kind of go back to what Brenda was talking about in a society or in a culture where you're not elevating the woman, you know, the womb of our existence, we're not elevating, then you have things of that nature that would happen. You know, I want to think... We let it happen. We let it happen. We don't come up with anything to counter it. Mm -hmm. man, decent men are going to have to police indecent men. Yeah. I'm going to have to cut you off because we have to go. But I want to thank you both for coming to the program. Very good. Brenda, Brenda and Vernon, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. As we are uh, closing out, uh, we're going to have uh, some uh, comments. I, I always appreciative of the comments that you all uh, give us, both positive and critique, you know, cri critical of the show. So as we close out, we will air some of those comments. And I want to thank you for tuning in. Thank you. Bye-bye.